great hope. of her service turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the trials the crosses the crucibles that have overwhelmed you all week will grow strangely dim right now as you gaze into that wonderful smiling face of Jesus brethren I know many of you have gone through trials this week you have questions you have pain you have hurt you have sickness that you are going through maybe even now sitting in this pew we are looking at your faces but nobody knows your inner pain cast it upon Jesus today he is waiting to take all of those 
and bear them for you. So I'm just inviting you to have faith and hope that these trials are going to get better because God has promised. And we know that he is more than capable. He has already borne them for us. We have to go through these little trials because we are fighting an enemy that wants to defeat us. But you and I know that the battle has already been won. And he can try all he wants. He cannot overwhelm us. Because what has Jesus said? That when we go through the flood, they shall not overflow us. Because he will be there parting the waters for us. We can go through on dry land like the Israelites did. So you know what, guys? It's been a while that we have gone down on our knees in church. This morning, I feel that we should go down on our knees because the saying goes that the devil trembles when he sees God's saints upon their knees. So as far as possible, if you can, let's go down on our knees and approach our heavenly king today. Dear Father, we turn our eyes to you today. We want to gaze into your wonderful, shining face so that the trials, the crosses that have tried to overwhelm us this week will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. What a wonderful God we serve. And Father, we just want to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory today because you are worthy to be praised. And we can do none other but just to thank you and to praise you for your wonderful goodness to us. This morning, Lord, your people bow before you. Lord, we have come with many trials we have come with sickness and pain. We have come with broken hearts and sadness, Lord. But when we look upon you, we see joy, we see hope, we see peace. Not the kind of peace that the world gives because they don't know peace if they don't know you. But Lord, because we know you, our God, our Father, we know and we feel that peace in our hearts and we want to thank you. Father, remember those that are bowing before you this morning who are sick, physically sick, Lord. You are our great physician. Those listening on the airways, you know their pain, you know their struggles this morning. Father, we are casting them before you. We are asking you, Lord, that you will go up and down these aisles, that you will visit every home of every individual tuning in this morning. And those who are not able to tune in, Lord, but their hearts and their minds are connected with us this morning, we are asking you to visit them. We are asking you, Lord, that you will touch them. Father, we're asking you that for whatever they're going through this morning, that you will bring relief, that you will whisper to them, Lord, that you will let them know that you are there, 
that you have not walked away from them. You have not turned your back on them. Uh, as some people might think you have abandoned them. Lord, you have not gone anywhere. You are there where you have always been at the cross, just waiting for us to come and to cast all our cares upon you. So this morning, Lord, we are thankful and we are grateful that we know you. We know you who you are. We know that you have not changed and that what you have said in your word, you will do for your people. And so we come and we are going to praise you and we are going to live in hope that one day, Lord, you are going to come and you are going to do away with all of this wickedness, all of this evil, all of this pain, this trial, this suffering. And you are going to make all things new. We live in expectation of that time, Lord. And we're asking that you will keep us faithful to the end. Father, we come with expectation of feasting at your table. We ask, Lord, that the food that you will spread will satisfy our longing hearts, will give us enough nourishment that will keep us through the week that is ahead of us, even today, Lord. Help us, Father, to eat as much as we can, because we know, Lord, that as we step through these doors, the enemy of our souls will be standing there waiting. But, Father, we have a God who knows and who has experienced all trial every temptation that we could ever experience you have been through it and so you know how to succor us you know how to uphold us with your righteous right hand and so we rest secure in your love and in your promise so father anoint your man servant put coals of fire upon his lips so that the words that he speak come not from him, but from the throne of grace. We thank you, Father. We pray for the musician that you will anoint her fingers as well. We pray that you will send your Holy Spirit upon your waiting people today. And Father, as we listen, as we partake, as we share in this feast, our bodies will be strengthened, our souls will be nourished, and our minds renewed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. responsible uh, for collecting this afternoon's tithe and offering come forward now for the past um, several weeks um, we've been going through um, a mini series during this tithe and offering period and uh, the the uh, idea that we were trying to, uh, I suppose, get across, uh, Sister Denise, is we wanted to come to a better understanding of what the tithe was. That's what we've been looking at in this period for these last several weeks. Uh, and uh, to, I, I suppose, summarize it all uh, very quickly, uh, we, we've looked at three time periods of the tithe uh, to date. 
the first uh, time period uh, uh, is the pre-Israelite tithe. Uh, and I say this because uh, the tithe is not something that was particular or relegated or restricted to the Israelite people, uh, but it actually pre-existed those people. Uh, we can see evidence of this, uh, not just in history, but in scripture. Uh, for the Bible lets us know that it was Abraham, the Hebrew, Abraham, uh, the Babylonian also, uh, who tithed onto Melchizedek of Salem. These two non-Israelites both understood uh, the institution of the tithe. Uh, following that period, we looked at tithe in the Old Testament, and we saw uh, that within the Israelite uh, religion, uh, the tithe had three main categories. The first purpose of the tithe uh, was to give on to the Levites who did not have any territorial uh, inheritance within Israel. The second purpose was to give on to the poor, and the third was for the meal for the entire congregation of Israel. Now, lastly, we looked at uh, the New Testament tithe, and we saw that there wasn't much mention of the, the tithe in the New Testament, and the reason there isn't much mention uh, is because it was already established fact and not something that needed to be relitigated, uh, similar to the Sabbath, in that you don't find an explanation of what the Sabbath is in the New Testament because that's something that's already been covered uh, extensively. Uh, now, today I want to end this mini-series uh, by looking at the the tithe in the early church period. Uh, and, and we know that the tithe exists in the early church period because of this document, uh, not only just history, this document is called the didache. Uh, in the Greek, this word didache, it means teaching. Uh, in particular, these were the teachings that flowed from the 12 apostles uh, that people were supposed to give on to the Gentiles. So this is the record of some of the things that they learned. And uh, this document, it is believed to have been formed formulated uh, in the first century, uh, uh, well, they, they say around 70 AD uh, to approximately uh, the second century, very early then. Uh, and I want to look at a particular text in the Didache. Uh, if we can turn uh, this slide, Didache 13 and 7, uh, it speaks of the tithe. It says this, uh, these people, again, the Didache exists to formulate a list of community rules. They're trying to pass on uh, how the apostles believe that the church ought to run. In Didache 13 and 7, it says, Of money also, and clothes, and of all your possessions, take the first fruits as it seems best to you, and give according to the commandment. Uh, this is them reiterating or re-emphasizing that this idea of the tithe that also existed in the early church period. So to summarize it all again, the tithe predates Israel. The tithe is a part of Israel. It's in the New Testament. And and it's also found in the early church as well. Uh, and as it is found in the early church, it is something that belongs within our church uh, as we continue uh, to honor God by returning our tithe and our offering. Now, here are some ways that you are able to give here at Temple of Praise. The first of them being, you can go to www.adventistgiving.org. This is my preferred preferred method. You type in the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are the one and only. There you can give to, uh, a tithe. You can give also to our local offering categories. You can also give on Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign Temple of Praise SDA. Uh, in your cash uh, app, uh, you can leave a note to where you want these funds to go and our treasurers or our treasury staff rather will appropriate, appropriate those funds to the appropriate place. Uh, you can also visit us or mail it in we are the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church located at 1985 Green Road, Cleveland, Ohio. The zip code is 44121. And as always, we thank you for every gift that you have given. Uh, we know uh, uh, that it did not come easily onto you, that many of you uh, uh, had to work long and hard hours. So we do not uh, 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 initiate any form of ingratitude for what it is that you have given onto our church. It is a blessing. And with that, we receive but we'll go ahead and pick it up at this time. Thank you. 
over will be poured into your lap for with the same measure you use it will be measured back onto you Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we just thank you that your hands have been upon us. Uh, Lord, that you have kept us uh, in good health. Uh, Lord, that you have allowed uh, income to continually make uh, its way onto us. Uh, Lord, that in the face that of all that we've been through uh, this week, Lord, we not only still have our jobs, uh, Lord, but we still have our right states of mind with us. Uh, Lord, we still have our families that are with us. And Lord, for these blessings, Lord, uh, no, we could not give you enough, but we return unto you a tenth of what is already yours. Uh, and dear God, we ask that you take uh, these funds, Lord, that you would break them up, multiply them, and use them, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and let every believer that is here say amen. 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 Please remain standing for our scripture reading. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, and we will read a very familiar verse. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. It is on the screen as well. So I'm going to invite all of us to read very slowly together. Don't go ahead of me. Revelation chapter 20, chapter 3 and verse 20. And it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Amen. Amen. May God bless his word. You may be seated. to him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence before his before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy god forgives our sins we must keep our eyes on him he's able to heal and give us victory i lay my sins on jesus I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them whole and frees us from the curse. 
said, Lord, from the cursed Lord, I bring my guilt to and song um, and for your, your ministry at, at home. I see your ministry is um, evident in uh, the fact that Elder Miller has returned unto us. We, we bless God uh, for, for Elder Miller uh, and, and for the fact that God has restored him uh, and brought him back here. Uh, I'm also thankful to uh, to see uh, two, two beautiful women that are with us in the midst. And uh, I can say that because I'm related to them both. Um, uh, the first of them being my mother-in-law is here. Uh, a charity of Wusu has come to us from uh, Chicago, Illinois. She's been a blessing uh, on to me tremendously. She came in, uh, I believe that was on Thursday, and, and Friday was such a, a wonderful day. Uh, because I was able to sleep, and uh, Ryan uh, was with his grandmother having the time of his life. So uh, we bless God for, for grandparents, um, uh, and I'm thankful also for his mother. My wife, Afi, is here as well. Uh, so I'm glad to see each of you uh, here with Ryan as well. Now, uh, as always, I come before you in the name of Yahweh, uh, for his name alone is excellent, and his glory is above the earth and the heavens. 
Uh, all power and authority has been granted unto his son, Yeshua, uh, whom we call Jesus. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we will exalt him today. Therefore, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. Uh, and greetings to you all again, especially those of you tuning in online who I haven't had the privilege to meet. My name is Renee Cannon. Uh, I'm the pastor of this here Temple of Praise, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, again, I am husband to one uh, Dr. Afia Cannon, father to R Ryan Lamar Quake, who uh, Cannon and privileged uh, to stand behind this desk today. Uh, I, I know I said last week that we would begin our series on the book of Mark, and I'm staying faithful to it. Uh, God began to encourage me because because when I came in, I went to the back. I found Sister Bolster. She had a book, a Bible open to the book of Mark. She had a note pad, and uh, she had some stuff wrote out, and I thought that she might have been writing a sermon. So I said, God is uh, really leading me in the correct direction now that I am aligned with Sister Bolster. So I want to uh, uh, invite you again to open up your Bibles uh, to the book of Mark, and we're going to look at our second installment uh, of this series. Uh, and as a reminder, I've been encouraging you that before you come, uh, you should go ahead and read that next chapter all the way through. Matter of fact, uh, after church today, when you go home, it'll be time to read Mark chapter 3, uh, and you can close your Sabbath with that. So I'm inviting you now to, to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 1 through 4. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and as is custom, I'm asking, once you found that version, if you are able, uh, that you would stand to your feet in honor and in reverence of God's holy word. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm reading and you're hearing from the New King James Version of the Bible this afternoon. The Bible says this, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Uh, now today, I just want to lift up this uh, title for our second installment, Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, now on last Sabbath, as, as I explained uh, to, to you uh, earlier on uh, in the service, uh, we, we were scheduled to go to the Greater Cleveland Aquarium. Uh, and, and we spent some time mapping this this whole trip out. See, the plan was uh, following service, we would all go back uh, to the fellowship hall. Uh, and then at the time, of, once after we ate, at the time of 3.30, we were going to depart Temple of Praise and be gone on to the Greater Cleveland Aquarium. Uh, now, this time of 3.30 was not something that was a time that was set arbitrarily or uh, at random, but the time 3.30 was chosen because the tour started at Four. Uh, and according to our GPS, uh, if we left at 3.30, we were supposed to arrive within 20 minutes, which would give us 10 minutes to spare before it was time for us to go into the aquarium. Uh, and I thank God that on that day, things were going uh, as planned. We went to the back and uh, we, we dined on the, the haystacks and such that were prepared. Uh, at the time of 3.30, the doors of the church were locked, the lights were off, and we were on the road driving to the Greater Cleveland Aquarium. And, and, and things began smooth as we made our way out of Euclid and into East Cleveland. Uh, things remained smooth as I got onto the highway. But as soon as I started to approach downtown, things began to change. 
for this was supposed to be a lazy Saturday afternoon, but for some reason, the road started to look like the busiest of Monday mornings. Um, I mean, when we got that downtown, cars were everywhere. There were cars to the left of us, cars to the right of us, cars behind us, cars in front of us. I mean, I was so close to the car in front of me that I could look through their window and read the text messages of the distracted drivers. I'm telling you, this is how many cars were downtown Cleveland uh, on last Saturday uh, and I began to get nervous so I got on my phone and I, I I started to call brother Clemens and brother Clemens told me that his testimony was the same that he was locked inside of traffic and then he let me know something even more dire um that there were no exits that we would be able to get off of and I soon confirmed it for every time I got near an exit which would let me go to the aquarium would you know the police had every exit blocked off. Um, and, and suddenly my estimated time of arrival on the GPS began to change. Um, it went from arriving at 350 to arriving at 357, then arriving at 410, then arriving at 430. And, and suddenly it began to dawn on me that I was not going to be able to make it to this aquarium. Uh, so with a heart full of defeat, you know, I wanted my son to see the aquarium for the first time. Uh, uh, we drove back home. And when I made it home, I, I, I start to wonder, what was all this traffic about? Um, I, I mean, the Browns were not even in town. Um, the Cleveland Guardians did not have a game. And the last time I checked, the Cleveland Cavaliers season has not even began. So I looked up current events on the Internet, and I found that the reason that there was so much much traffic is because there was an artist called Machine Gun Kelly that was having a concert downtown. And because this man was having a concert, over 50,000 concert goers had descended on downtown Cleveland. Uh, and as I thought about this number, 50,000, uh, I began to be astonished um, because I couldn't believe that 50,000 people um, would be in a city uh, just to see this concert of this artist. Um, uh, and I began to wonder um, uh, if 50,000 people were even in their churches on Sabbath on Cleveland. Um, I mean, if you added all the churches up together, um, would, any, would the number amount to 50,000 people in their churches in the city of Cleveland? Um, and as I thought about it, I realized that that means we need a paradigm shift as it pertains to ministry. Uh, for, for many times, we find ourselves promoting individuals. Um, we find ourselves promoting um, the best preachers, teachers, evangelists, and singers. Um, but this thing is not working. Um, what we need to instead do uh, is recommit ourselves to the great commission that Jesus has given us. Um, we need to move beyond promoting people and become dedicated and excited about promoting Jesus. Um, because I guarantee um, that if we start telling people Jesus was in the house, um, people would be showing up because who wouldn't want to be in a place in which Jesus is in the house. And I know that from looking in the text, when you look uh, at Mark chapter 2, um, uh, verse 1, the Bible immediately says um, that it was noised about or that it was heard in the town of Capernaum that Jesus was in the house. Um, and you got to see the outcome of Jesus being in the house. Um, because Jesus was in the house, it meant everything around it was packed. Um, when you read the text, it says that it was so tightly packed um, uh, uh, that there was not even room by the doors. Um, and what this means, uh, Brother Joe, is that people were standing shoulder to shoulder in this room. Uh, people were standing heel to toe in this place. Um, and if you went outside, there were even people pressed up against the walls. Um, I bet it looked like um, one of the most popular nightclubs that you had ever seen. Um, and I, I'm thinking back to my own days um, uh, of visiting such establishments. Um, uh, uh, Sister Levy, and, and, and one of the things that I know about clubs is they have capacity levels limits and capacity limits what they say is only this amount of people are allowed within this space and the reason they have capacity limits is because if a fire or something breaks out um you don't want people getting trampled on the way out the door um but what this text lets us know is that people were not concerned with their proximity to other people people were not even concerned about their own personal safety um but the most important thing to these people was that Jesus was in the house. 
Looking at the text, these people who are on the inside are not the only ones that are excited. Uh, for outside of that building uh, was an individual uh, uh, that the text calls uh, uh, one who is sick of the palsy. Um, uh, in the Greek, um, it says that he is a paralyticon. In the English, we identify this person uh, as an individual who suffers from paralysis. Um, and, and what we know about paralysis is that it is a, a, a disorder of the central nervous system. And, and, and what this disorder causes is a complete loss of functionality of the muscles within the body. I want you to think about the plight of this paralyzed man with me. Um, uh, this brother was not able to move um, his arms and his legs. Um, that means every time that he needed to use the bathroom, somebody needed to be near him him. Uh, uh, every time uh, uh, he laid too long in a spot, he needed somebody to come and roll him over. Um, uh, every time he needed a bath, um, he couldn't even do it by himself, but but somebody had to come and wipe him down. Uh, this man had arms that could not lift him and legs that could not carry him, and therefore this individual was left feeling like he was completely and utterly useless. Now, I know there's some individuals that are hearing me today uh, that have dealt um, or are dealing with some disabilities. And you understand exactly what this paralyzed man was going to, through. But some of you believe um, that since you are here in good health, um, that you don't understand what it means to be paralyzed. Um, but I'll have you to know um, that the paralysis is not just something that is a physical condition, um, but it's... Um, and we, and what I mean by this is that paralysis can be depicted as anything that causes you uh, uh, to stop moving in the direction God has called you to go. Some of you have been paralyzed um, by some of the bad decisions that you have made in your life. Um, uh, some of you are paralyzed by poverty and bad credit. Um, uh, some of you are paralyzed by criminal records and such. Um, uh, some of you are paralyzed um, by your own fear of failure. Um, you won't move forward into what God has called you to, uh, to. So you stay in the same place because you find yourself paralyzed. The Bible says that this brother was paralyzed. Um, he felt completely and utterly useless. Um, but I do want you to know that there is some gospel good news in the passage. Um, for even though this brother was paralyzed, um, the text also says that he was born of four uh, or that he was carried by four. Uh, and, and what this means is that even though he was paralyzed, um, this brother had some friends um, that were able to lift him up when he was down. I wish somebody heard me preaching today. And, and, and what you need in your life um, is not just people um, who will empathize and sympathize with you. Um, not just people that will listen to all your worries and woes um, who will offer a shoulder to cry on. But you need some friends in this lifetime that are able to pick you up and take you to Jesus. Um, I testify this on my own um, because even as a pastor, I've had times in which uh, I not only wanted to uh, 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 resign the pulpit, but I wanted to walk away altogether. Um, but what I had in my own life um, is some individuals I can get on the phone up uh, and they would pick me up in prayer um, and take me to Jesus. Um, and that's exactly what you need in your life. Um, you've got friends that can take you to concerts. Um, you've got friends that you can gossip with on the late night. Um, but do you have any friends um, that are able to see you when you're down at your lowest? Um, that are able to stop by, pick you up and take you to Jesus? The Bible lets us know that even though this brother was paralyzed, what he had working in his favor was a company, a group of friends for exactly the new Jesus. You need some friends that know Jesus and look at their commitment in the passage because they're, 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 they're set to take him to Jesus. So, 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 so first they had to go and get him. I don't know how long they came from, but he's on a mat and uh, they have to carry him on a mat. Now, I know uh, many people make excuses whenever they got to move anything. Um, and in fact, if you want to know if you got a, a real friend, um, just tell them that you're moving uh, and you need a help. Uh, and, and don't even say you need help uh, with a refrigerator. Just tell them you need help with a few small boxes and, and watch how many excuses that they start coming 
coming with, um, uh, how they have to take their gerbil to the veterinarian and all this other kind of stuff. Whenever people need to pick up and use their bodies, they start making excuses. Um, but he didn't have friends like that. He had friends that were willing to pick him up and take him to where Jesus was, no, no matter how far they had to go. And, and, and when they came across, there were obstacles in the way for there was a crowd outside, um, but they maneuvered around the crowd. Um, they made it to the house and tried to go through the door, um, uh, but the door was blocked um, by all the people pressing against it. Uh, I imagine that they even tried to slide the brother through the window, um, but there was no space to get him in. Um, and that would have been enough for most of us to say, hey, look, brother, we tried uh, and it's time to go home. Uh, but these brothers were determined to get their friend to Jesus. They wouldn't stop. So, so they took him around the back to the stairwell and they start climbing up the stairs of the house. Now, if I was the homeowner, I would have came outside at this point um, and, and, and began to look and say, I know you in a desperate situation, uh, but what are you doing climbing on top of my house? Um, but these brothers would not even be deterred by that, for they had the nerve um, not only to take them to the roof, um, but they start picking up the tiles on the roof. They start pulling the tiles back and uh, 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 opening up the roof on this person's house. Um, uh, and I imagine that as they stayed there inside of the house and they saw the sunlight coming in, uh, they began to think this sun ain't supposed to be shining uh, on the inside of my house from the top. Um, uh, I can see the small pieces and particles of, of the ceiling uh, raining down on their heads. Um, and, and the meeting com coming to a complete stop um, because these people were annoyed. Um, that this individual was breaking into the house. Um, but never did they stop. They just continued until they lowered their friend right before the presence of Jesus. They brought him all the way in to the house. And now this paralytic, he's sitting in front of Jesus. Bless his name. Uh, you know, you got to read Luke's account of this story. For, for Luke, he tells the same story in his book, and uh, he has some interest in it in uh, being a physician. What he says about Jesus is that in that moment, the power was present to heal them. Uh, I, I wish somebody was hearing me today. So not only has he come before Jesus uh, with his paralysis, um, uh, but the power uh, is present um, to heal him from the condition uh, that he going through him. Um, and as he sits there, you got to feel the hope that is welling up in this brother, uh, for he begins to think of all the shame that he experiences um, when people have to wipe him in places he doesn't want wiped by another individual. Um, he begins to think of um, uh, how he's been a burden onto his family and friends um, that have to carry him to this place and that place. Um, he begins to think um, how he's not able to make a living on his own, uh, but people lay him out on the ground. Um, that he might beg money by the passers-by. Um, and he knew that in that moment, um, Jesus was going to heal him. So watch what happens. He's sitting there waiting on this healing, and, and, and Jesus looks at him, and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Yeah, y'all happy. I would have been mad. I don't, I don't think you was listening to, to, to where we were going with this. You know, let, 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 me, let me take you again. I started, I said that this man came uh, understanding that he needed a healing. The power was present to heal them, but, but, but Jesus didn't heal him. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, now, if it was me, I would have been a bit confused at that point um, uh, uh, because with all due respect, um, uh, 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 I came here because I am paralyzed. Um, uh, I had all my friends come and bring me into this place. Um, uh, uh, we had to come past the press or the crowd. We had to drop in through the roof. Um, you know all this took for my body just to get in this space. Um, I didn't come here uh, to talk about the past or to deal with any sins, um, but Jesus looks at this man who he is supposed to heal and and he has the nerve to say, son, your sins are forgiven. 
in my study, I began to ponder this thing because it doesn't make any sense when you look at the context of what has happened. And especially in the previous chapters, Jesus has been healing uh, everybody, but now he changes his prerogative uh, to forgiving uh, uh, sins. And, and as I began to think about it, uh, Dr. Warren, what, 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 what was revealed to me uh, is that uh, uh, his thoughts are not our thoughts, um, and his ways are not our ways. Um, for higher is the heavens and then the earth um, than his thoughts from my thoughts and his ways from our ways. Um, and what God was showing me uh, is that many times um, when people look at problems, um, we are only treating symptoms. Um, but what Jesus wants to do, um, he wants to get down to the etiology or he wants to get down to the root cause of that thing. Um, so he was saying um, that the paralysis was a symptom, but the root of it all was the sin. Now, I want to be clear with somebody today. Uh, for I'm not saying to you uh, that uh, disabilities are caused by sin. We, we, we've seen this in the gospel um, where the disciples ask, um, who sinned that this person could be born blind? Uh, I, I'm not saying um, that disabilities, that sickness uh, and, and such are caused uh, by sin. But what I am saying is that the origin of all suffering, all pain, and all sickness in the entire earth uh, is sin. Um, because from the beginning of time it was not so uh, but because sin has passed down through mankind from Adam all of these things have come to exist and Jesus looks at it and says um, uh, the paralysis is but a symptom I'm going to treat the root which is the sin you know, I started to understand this thing when I read an article about um, the Washington Monument. Um, uh, the Washington Monument, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it is that obelisk uh, that's in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and, and there was a time um, in which the Washington Monument was actually uh, decaying or deteriorating. And the reason that it was deteriorating is because of the harsh chemicals that they used to clean it with. Um, so a group of people got together and they decided we needed to change the uh, chemicals chemicals um, that we can slow down uh, 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 the decomposition of the monument. Um, and while the less harsh chemicals worked, um, even if you slow down uh, uh, deterioration, it is still deteriorating. Um, so what another group came and said um, is that the problem is not the chemicals. Um, the problem uh, is these birds that are dropping upon the monument. Um, but, the, but even inside of that, the problem isn't actually the birds. Um, the problem is actually this light. Um, for there was a light light that used to shine upon the Washington Monument at night. And, and what would happen is little bugs would start flying around the Washington Monument. The birds would then come and eat those bugs and then they would litter their droppings upon the monument. Are you uh, hearing what I'm saying today? Uh, so therefore, what they decided is that in order to stop the Washington Monument from breaking down, they would just cut the light on a little bit later. Um, they were getting down to the root cause of the condition. Uh, and what I dropped by to tell you today um, is that those toxic relationships, um, they're just uh, symptoms of the real issue. Um, uh, that bad credit, it is a symptom of what is going on. Uh, the problems some of us endure with our health, um, they are but symptoms of what is really happening. Uh, the failure for us to advance, um, they are but symptoms that are really going on. For many times, what is actually holding us back in our lives is the sin. Uh, and that's why Jesus said, I'm saying to you that your sins are forgiven. Amen. He says his sins are forgiven. Uh, and, 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 and I see uh, while there is not much of response about sins being forgiven, uh, for till this day I understand that not every individual is going to be happy that you have been forgiven of your sins. You know, I, I know this thing for, 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 for certainty. You know, when I was back in high school, you know, I used to make all kinds of mistakes. I've been uh, suspended for everything that you can possibly think of being suspended for. Um, but, you know, that was 20-something years ago, you know, and I figure those things have since uh, passed. You know, I, I've gone on and gone to school and become a pastor and all of these things. Um, well, i got a reminder um, that just because God has forgotten, um, just because God has forgiven you, don't mean 
everybody around you has forgotten. Um, and I saw this on Facebook. I'm in a, a forum with all of my high school uh, classmates. Uh, and, and then I saw my name pop up. I got excited. I thought somebody found a picture from me from back in the day. Um, but when I clicked on the link, um, uh, to my surprise and dismay, uh, they had my name in a scandal. Uh, they said, do you remember when Renee Cannon used to do thus and thus? Um, when you remember when Renee Cannon you used to do this and that? Um, and what I learned from this um, is that everybody uh, is not going to be excited about you being forgiven of your sins um, because there are still people that live in your past um, and because they live in their past they never want you to move forward from it um, therefore in your life everybody ain't gonna be happy um, there are some folk that, that are gonna be upset when they see that you're moving on um, there are some folk that are gonna say all of a sudden you acting brand new and like you're better than everybody else um, there are some people that will not be happy when you are forgiven of your sins we can see it <clears throat> also give me a little bit more volume here we can see it uh, in the text for the text says that in that group there were some individuals that were none too pleased um, with Jesus um, uh, uh, forgiving this man's sins. Uh, in the passage, they are identified as the scribes. Um, particularly, the text says, um, you know, who is this? You know, the, the scribes, they begin to ask, who is this man who believes he has the authority to forgive sins? He says, who is this one who is blaspheming against our God? <laughs> And this is why they think this. You got to understand scribes in this time. The scribes are what we would call uh, experts um, uh, in uh, the exegetical interpretation, um, in the exposition and the explanation uh, of the scripture. These are, in a in literate society, the scribes are one of the few people that can read. Um, so therefore, anytime someone had a question about what was going on in scripture, they would also always come uh, to the scribes um, and because the scribes had studied the Bible for so long um, one of the things that they understood um, is that the forgiveness of sins was a prerogative that belonged to God and God alone um, we know this because Isaiah 43 uh, in verse 25 um, the Bible says um, I am he um, uh, uh, that blots out your transgressions um, for my own sake and remember them no more so watch this if an individual would come and say that they are able to forgive sins um what they are in effect doing is saying that god is a lie for he is the only one that is able to forgive sins um and if you look at leviticus 24 and 16 the bible declares um that the um, for blaspheming God is to be put to death. Um, so therefore, what the scribes were saying um, is that Jesus has just blasphemed our God. Um, he has just lied on him, and therefore he deserves to be put to death. They say he deserves to be put to death. And I like Jesus response to everything that he is that he sees for, for for he looks at him he says look he says you know they, they they're thinking it's interesting they, they're having thought uh jesus is already reading their minds and he says to them you know which is it easier for me to do uh look is it easier for me to say son your sins are forgiven uh, or, or for me to look at him and say arise take up your bed and walk uh, but he said, but, but so you may know uh, that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. He looked at the paralytic and said, arise take up your bed and walk. Um, and I told you, I like the book of Mark um, because the book of Mark displays the power of God. Um, for Mark don't take time doing anything. Um, that's why when you look at this paralytic, um, it doesn't say um, that he had to go to physical therapy uh, in the text. Um, it don't say um, that he was doing any squats and any ankle lifts to get up on his feet. Um, but the text says immediately or straightway, uh, he got up on his feet um, and the people began praising the Lord. Um, 
And the reason they praised the Lord um, is because they saw this individual that was once down, um, now up on his feet. Um, the reason they were praising the Lord um, is because they saw this one who was useless. Um, now he's becoming useful. Um, the reason they were praising the Lord um, is because the individual who was on his back was now on his feet. Um, that's the reason these people were praising the Lord. Uh, however, that ain't even the greatest part of the text. <clears throat> For even though I love that he raised the paralytic, that's not what gets me most excited about the text, Sister Denise. Uh, for if you remember, the scribes were still wondering who this man who thought he had the right to forgive sins was. Well, looking back to the text, um, we see Jesus answering it when he calls himself the son of man. And now this phrase son of man was a messianic title that Jesus applied to himself, uh, which expressed the fact that his origins were in heaven, um, that his mission was on earth and that his kingdom was soon to come. Somebody ought to say amen in this place. Um, and you can see this idea of the son of man most prominently or prevalently displayed in Daniel chapter seven, um, where the Bible says um, that in the end time that many kingdoms would come to dominate and oppress the people of God, um, but that in the end, a being called the Son of Man um, would overthrow them all uh, and establish an everlasting kingdom with the saints. Um, therefore, um, when the scribes were wondering who Jesus was, um, when he called himself the Son of Man, um, he was telling them that the Messiah was in the house. Um, when he called himself the Son of Man, um, he was saying that the Christ was in the house. Um, when he called himself the son of man, um, he was saying um, that the one who being in the form of God um, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God um, was in the house. Um, or in other words, Jesus was saying um, that God in the flesh um, was in the house. Um, and when you read the New Testament, um, one thing you find um, is that good things always happen um, when Jesus is in the house. Um, for when Jesus was in the house, um, he healed his mother of the fever. Um, he touched the disease um, and he exercised the demon possessed. Um, when Jesus was in the house, um, he dined with tax collectors and thieves um, and he accepted women um, that had been rejected by society. Um, when Jesus was in the house, um, he threw out all the unbelievers um, and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Um, when Jesus was in the house, um, he spoke a word to a Syrophoenician woman uh, and caused her daughter to be healed. Um, when Jesus Jesus was in the house. Um, he made the sophisticated simple and the perplexing parables plain. Um, when Jesus was in the house, um, he told his people um, that money ain't an issue with me. Um, I can put coin in a fish's mouth. Uh, and the good news for you today uh, is that Jesus didn't just do that in their houses, um, but he wants to do it in your house too. Um, that's why the Bible says, um, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Um, and if anyone hears my voice um, and opens the door, um, I will come in the house and sup with them. Uh, and when Jesus is in your house, um, broken families can be put back together. Um, when Jesus is in your house, um, destructive ways will be exchanged for healthy habits. Um, when Jesus is in your house, um, your bread will not lack uh, and your oil will not fail. Um, when Jesus is in your house, um, you will experience the joy of the Lord. Um, when Jesus is in your house, um, he'll show you the vision that he has for your future. Um, I'm trying to help somebody today. Um, you've got the real housewives in your house. Um, you've got the news anchors in your house. Um, you've got gossip in your house. Uh, and none of them have a thing to do for you. Um, what you need to have is Jesus in your house. Um, I just wish I had two or three people um, that would open up your mouth uh, and say Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house and when he was in the house 
all of the people were packed around him because they expected that healing would take place simply because Jesus was in the house. And this thing is uh, uh, twofold as I study through uh, this text and more. This thing is twofold to us. You know, the command goes forward uh, not only for us to tell others about Jesus being in this house, um, but the command goes forth uh, for us to go home and bring Jesus in our homes. That's what's going to make the difference because when you got Jesus with you, when you go outside the house, Jesus is still with you and people will be able to see that they know uh, who is and who ain't spending time with Jesus. You believe the word of God, I want to invite you just to stand with me today as Jesus is in the house. Amen. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed in this moment. Two appeals, they're, they're simple. The first one goes for those individuals struggling in the home. You want to experience the healing of your family. You want to uh, experience brokenness being put back together. Uh, husbands and wives coming back together. Uh, uh, siblings um, getting rid of senseless robberies. Mothers and fathers um, uh, uh, being joined uh, back together with their children. You want to experience the healing uh, that comes in the house. Uh, uh, the, the, the Bible lets us know that when Jesus was in that house, uh, the power was present to heal them. Uh, and when you've got Jesus in your house, the power is is present to heal that home too. You're here today. You want to to, to, to invite Jesus back in your home. You know uh, that, that, that you feel as if he hasn't been there in quite some time and you want to make that invitation on today. I'm inviting you to raise your hand. We want to pray for these families today. Amen. Amen. We want to pray for these families all over uh, this place uh, today uh, that Jesus will begin to mend uh, uh, our families, um, uh, our marriages, um, uh, our relationships with our sons, uh, our daughters, our mothers and fathers. The power is present in Jesus to heal you. My second invitation is simple. Somebody is here today and perhaps you don't have that relationship uh, with Christ, again, Jesus is present. Uh, uh, the power is present to heal. Uh, uh, you want that relationship with God today. Uh, uh, you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's healing that takes place after this baptism. Uh, for the Bible lets us know that once you go down, it is a form of resurrection. You, you go down into the water, uh, uh, you are holding uh, uh, your breath. When you come up, you, you, you are resurrected. That is life anew, uh, uh, which seeks, uh, speaks to a sort of healing that is happening uh, on this earth today. You are here today. You're tuning in with us online. You're here today, and you want to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You are making that commitment today to be baptized. Today is the day. You don't want to wait another day. You want to start this track today. We got a baptism coming up. You want to be a part of that. You want to be baptized. I'm asking that you would raise your hand today. You're in the house today. God has spoken to you. You want to be baptized. You realize that the power is present to heal, but you got to be there to get it. Are you online? Please drop us a comment and we'll receive that as well. And one last thing, you're here today. You want to uh, 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 join the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church. You've heard the word of God here. You've experienced the love here. You've been looking uh, for a church about and You want to become a member of the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church. You want to join by transfer a membership uh, or profession of faith. You're here today. Write that in the comments. I want to join. If you're here today, you can raise your hand. You want to become a member of the Temple of Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you're in this house. Lord, and I thank you that because you were here, Lord, the, the power to heal has been present with us as well. So I, I, I thank you for the relief that you brought to us today. Lord, for, for, for that much needed healing uh, that you have wrought 
in, in, in the body or in the spirit of those individuals who have heard your word today. Lord, and I'm asking that you would help us not to keep it to ourselves. Lord, that we would share this word uh, with our friends, with our families. Lord, that we would share this on our social media pages. Lord, that the word of God might go forth on today. Lord, we bless you today for what it is that you have done within this place, uh, as well as what it is that you will do. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and let us all say amen. Come on and put your hands together and bless the Lord in this place. Mm. Amen. Amen. In benediction, the Bible says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace in your home, peace in your heart, peace when you come, and peace as you go in Jesus' name. And let us all say amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord as the ushers prepare to usher you out. If you would like um, a word uh, with me, you can just stick by in the pews. Come up to the front and we can have.